You're listening to the House Hacking Podcast, the blueprint for one of the best financial life hacks there is, house hacking. If you are looking to get ahead financially or learn about the easiest way to get started with real estate investing, then you are in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of individuals from all walks of life that use house hacking to eliminate their housing costs and accelerating their path to financial independence. Your number one place for all things house hacking. Sean, I am so excited to have you on. I've been following you and Sharon on Instagram uh, forever, so it's really cool to have you on. How you doing? Where are you calling in from? Yeah, Andrew, thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm calling in from the Bay Area in California. Awesome. So do you actually live in San Francisco? Or are you down in Palo Alto, over in Oakland? Yeah, I'm about an hour south from San Francisco, so it's considered the South Bay. I'm over in Milpitas, California, small city next to San Jose. Well, I was actually born in San Jose. Me and my brother and sister were, were all born out there. So don't That's remember awesome. much of it, but yeah, we're, we're Northern California uh, folks. You know, for folks that are listening and don't really know you, you know, give us a little bit of this high level recap of your, your house hacking experience and real estate and sort of where you're at. And then we'll dive into more of your story. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I was born and raised here in the Bay Area, went to school in Los Angeles for college. And while I was studying, uh, in college, I studied as an electrical engineer. So after I graduated, you know, the whole uh, dream is to then get a good job and then save up money and then yeah. go for retirement. But the thing was, man, after just like a few weeks of working at a full-time job after graduating, I realized that all my coworkers were super unhappy with where they were in life. And they wish they had taken more risk when they were younger. And so that got me thinking, like, if I don't want to end up like them, I need to start doing something now. Um, I guess long story short, I got into a great real estate deal. You know, my mom actually was moving away from this area and she was thinking of selling her house. And me thinking about buying real estate, I said, no, 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 wait, let me uh, buy it from you. I'll keep that as a rental property while I still work in Los Angeles. It just so happened that at that time, uh, my company was looking for somebody to move up to Northern California to work on a project uh, temporarily. But I figured, oh, I have this property here. I can just live in this house. Um, so, you know, we bought the property and moved in there. It was super lonely at first, so eventually I started getting some roommates in there. Asked some of my other friends who were also moving in from Los Angeles to Northern California if they wanted to live with me. And of course, I would give them the friend discount. Uh, so very quickly, I had my house rented out to all my friends from college and basically house hacked uh, by accident. Um, but then from then, I understood, okay, cool. I own this house. I'm getting rents. It's paying for a mortgage. It's paying for my utilities and my taxes. And... Wow, if I can do it with one property, what if I buy more properties? Yeah. And so that kind of got me into real estate investing. And you know, it's been about five years now. And it's been quite a ride since then. Awesome. So you did electrical engineering. What year did you graduate? Yeah, I graduated from UCLA in 2013. And then I got my master's in 2014. Oh, so you went right from undergrad to grad. And I mean, did you understand personal finances at that point or were you graduating with some student loan debt or, I mean, what, what was the like financial mindset when you were at, at this point in life? Yeah. So I was very fortunate that when I was growing up, my mom just would not buy me anything I wanted. You know, I wanted a PS2, I wanted a PS3. She's like, no, you have to work for it. And she would save money uh, in an account for me so that when I went to college, she actually had that enough saved for me. And during my last year of school, I actually got a job, an internship at Boeing. Um, Luckily, by working at that company, they were able to pay for my last year of college and sponsor me for my master's degree, which is why I jumped in so quickly because oh, yeah. it was being paid for by the company. Awesome. I mean, I would have taken them up on that as well. Like if, if yeah. that was a field and in and the, they were going to pay for the whole master's. All right. So then did Boeing require you to stay or did like, was there this period of like, hey, you got to stay on for two more years because we paid for that master's or, you know, is that also when you took the transfer north? Exactly. So they did require me to stay for two years. Otherwise, I'd have to pay that money back. Um, but then, of course, during that time, that company was actually not going through a great phase. And uh, they weren't able to offer me the greatest package when they were hiring me on full time from an internship. So actually, I took a job with another competitor, Northrop Grumman, and I negotiated. I said, hey, I would take your company, your offer, but I need to pay back this other company. Can you then give me a bonus to then pay them back? And we worked it out. So I didn't have to make that uh, sacrifice. So you, you already had some negotiation skills going, going on right there. 
Yeah, and I want to point out too, when I was working at the company, so the very first company I worked at was Boeing, and I thought it was really cool, got to work on satellites, got to work as an engineer. But then, like I said, within like two weeks or so, I realized that none of my coworkers were happy with where they were in life. And my role was a test engineer. So while we were working on these you know, multi-billion dollar pro- uh, projects, uh, there was a lot of downtime where we could just you know, press play, make the test run, and then we just have to monitor and wait. So that actually gave us a lot of free time to like read books or listen to podcasts. And during that time, that's when I built up my own financial education. Because again, I was searching for a way out. How can I escape this life that I don't want to be in? Um, and yeah, and that's how I got into these different books about understanding finances, investing, and real estate. So, I mean, did you, how'd you end up learning about these different resources? And I mean, we'll, we'll get to this opportunity with your mom moving and you buying the house, but I mean, so you're in there, you've got this downtime, people are hating their job and you're just starting to poke around. Or did you have a friend that was like, Hey, you know, Tim Ferriss's for our work week or Mr. Money Mustache. I mean, like, or was it just you're Googling and went down the rabbit hole? Yeah, it was more so Googling. And then it was so funny because I was walking with my girlfriend at the time at a Barnes and Noble and happened to walk by this super flashy purple book, Rich Dad Poor Dad. I thought, oh, this is an interesting book, interesting name. I read the first few pages. I thought, this is a great story. So then I went home and I bought the prop, uh, that book myself. And then just by reading through it, I understood like, okay, wow, this is definitely not what I was being told growing up. You know, my mom was a software engineer here in the Bay Area, but she was only getting paid like maybe 80 grand a year. So I, I never understood like what's, what it was like to invest in things and build wealth other than from getting a good job. Um, yeah, so from just going on that one book then opened me up to doing my own research and reading more books and going through more websites. I mean, it's crazy how many people had the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book like open them up to this whole, whole other world. Um, yeah, it's interesting concepts that just aren't talked about in yeah. uh, normal daily life. So how long was it from you realizing all your coworkers hated their job to your mom getting ready to move and sell her house. Yeah. So that was actually around three years. Okay. So during that time, you know, you can, you can imagine like, I'm super excited. I want to do something really quickly. And actually during that time I was still living in Los Angeles. So I was thinking about house hacking and buying a fourplex in somewhere that I could afford, which would you know be South central, which is probably not the best place to, to live. Right. But, uh, that was like the only option at the time. So I was looking at property pretty actively at that time. And, you know, thank goodness I didn't buy anything because it gave me the opportunity to then buy this property when I moved up to NorCal. Okay, awesome. All right, so you, you got the job opportunity to move up north. Your mom was getting ready to sell the house. And you mentioned, you're like, hey, let's actually turn this into a rental. I mean, did mom, you know, was she stone cold hard? Like you paid full full retail value or did she give you the, hey, you know, favorite son discount? I mean, how did that whole process work, work out with your your mom? Yeah, I mean, we do our best to keep everything within the family. So, you know, she understood that I wasn't making a lot of money at the time. And in her eyes, she needed enough to support her new lifestyle when she moved to Taiwan. So, uh, you know, I was obviously able to get it at below market value, but still enough that, you know, I sought to pay uh, a decent amount out of my own check. Yeah. yeah. And then how did you end up financing that property? So that one was just a conventional loan. You know, we put 20% down and then financed 80%. Awesome. And then was there any issues with the lender sort of saying like, hey, this isn't really an arm's length transaction or did they really not care? Yeah, actually, we went through two lenders. So the very first lender did have an issue with that. And, you know, we told them right from the beginning, hey, this is a non arm's length transaction and uh, it's a son buying the property from the mom. Uh, And at first they were cool with it. But then within one week of us expecting to close, they pulled back because the underwriter didn't like the deal. And unfortunately, you know, they weren't really good at explaining why they didn't like it. Yeah. And they also didn't, uh, you know, kind of work with us or try to find some solution. They said, sorry, we can't do it. And then it just kind of broke communications with us. But luckily we were able to find another mortgage broker who could work with us. And then we closed the deal within just a few short weeks. And so this is like 2016 when you bought the property? Yeah, it was late 2015. Okay. So 2015 in, you know, you put... Tw- 20% down. So what was your actual payment on the place? You know, a single family home, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms? And then what was your, your payment all in on the place? Yeah. So this property is around 1500 square feet in the Bay area. It's three bedroom, two bath. The downstairs is a converted like garage area. Now 
for the longest time, we used this garage area as like a separate TV room. So no one was actually living here. So for the most part, it was like three rooms and two bathrooms. And then one bathroom is in the master. So you only have one common bathroom for everyone else. As far as the mortgage is concerned, it was around $1,600 per month. But then we also had about a $200 per month payment because of flood insurance. So you know, that's one thing I didn't know either. Like I didn't know that some properties, you have to buy flood insurance if it's in like a flood zone. Um, now you can imagine that's the extra cost I didn't expect. Yeah, I mean, here in New Orleans, we're, we, we got to buy the flood insurance. And l- luckily for us, it's not too, too expensive um, on the couple properties we have here. But yeah, I mean, if you don't realize it and then all of a sudden the lender requires it, you know, an extra $200 a month, that could eat into cash flow if it's a true rental property. Um, all right, so you were going to live in it by yourself. You made enough to qualify on your own. And then you said you sort of like got lonely. I mean, did, did you really understand like real estate investing in house hacking? And like when, when you were buying this deal, like did it meet the 1% rule and 2% rule? Or was it sort of, hey, my mom is leaving. I could buy this place and I could get a good deal on it. It'd be good for her. Um, like where were you at at that point in your real estate investing career? Because obviously now you own multiple properties, but I mean, did you know deal analysis at this point yet? Yeah, so at the time I was very into bigger pockets, but I don't think I had listened to all the episodes at the time. I was just kind of very active on the forums. And I understood the whole 1% rule, but you know, in, in the Bay Area, if you can get a property for below market value and you can hold on to it, I think for the most part people don't care about like the 1% rule or things yeah. like that cuz it's it's very much an appreciation play. Yeah. Um like just as an example, you know, when I bought this property, even though I got it at a great discount, the market value for this home was probably around 750,000. So this is around, you know, 2015. Right now, it's probably worth 1.15. Maybe 1.1, right? That's a that's a huge gap, a huge leap from where it was just 5 years ago. And I I don't think you could make like that 400,000 buying a, another property elsewhere. Like I don't expect to make 400,000 on my rental properties out of yeah. state. Yeah. I mean, you know, a quarter million dollars plus, you know, 350,000 in five years isn't too shabby at all. So, I mean, you, you started getting lonely and then you had these extra rooms and it was really just, Hey, a friend needed a place to stay and you invited them in, or did you really sort of pursue this at this point of house hacking? Yeah. So actually what I did was when I first moved in, uh, because I remember we were planning on making this a rental and my mom had lived in this property for almost 30 years and it was in very like original condition. It wasn't the best and probably couldn't get market rents. So uh, my dad actually helped me out with renovating the property. Um, we spent around $30,000 to change the floors, repaint the house, uh, upgrade the kitchen. And actually we didn't even touch the bathroom. So it was very much like a light uh, rehab. So when I first moved in, I was like, wow, this house is amazing. It's like way better than the house I grew up in. Um, and yeah, so I said, you know what, I want to rent this out because I don't want to live here by myself. I feel like it's a waste and I think there, I could help out some of my friends. So I took a couple of photos, posted on Facebook, and then like a friend of a friend showed this to another friend of mine and then they got in contact with me. Um, we spoke over the phone, I gave him the video tour and then he liked it, moved in about two months later. And then that was my first roommate. Awesome. All right. So. Did you do tenant screening? I mean, you, you had mentioned you hadn't listened to all the bigger pockets episodes yet, or was this still like early in your investing career of like, oh, it's a friend of a friend, sounds great, handshake, you know, and that's it? Or was there screening and Elise involved? For this one, he was actually a friend. Well, I was he was a good acquaintance of mine. I have already known him for about seven years at that point, but we weren't super close. And even though I posted on Facebook, he only heard about that post because another mutual friend of ours kind of sent it to him first. And you know, since I knew him uh, for a good amount of time, I didn't do any kind of credit screening and I knew where he worked and I knew he was a pretty good dude. So I just let him in. And then w- what did the friend end up having to uh, pay for rent? So I gave him a super good like homie discount and I only charged him $600 a month. And uh, that at that time was really super low because you could possibly rent out a room in this area for around $900 a month, possibly even $1,000 if it was like really nice. But for me, again, my main purpose was I didn't want to live in this house by myself. Yeah. I wanted to bring value to my friends. And also I figured that if I asked for a lower price, then he wouldn't annoy me with all these like small knickknacks here, right? Like if you charge him a premium, then he's going to expect like a premium location. Yep. 
but premium location and premium service. Exactly. Uh, I'm like, you know what? You can handle your own stuff. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to charge you a little bit less. Yeah, it's like, I don't want to complain. This is a pretty sweet setup. So, you know, I'll, I'll deal with little stuff. I mean, that's sort exactly. of a good strategy in itself. All right. And then you ended up getting a second roommate along the way as well. Yeah. So about six months later, um, I had another friend who was doing a very similar thing in Fremont. So he had kind of acquired his parents' place because they moved to Taiwan as well. And we had another neutral friend living with him. But after a certain time, he was like, you know what? I want to live by myself. Sorry. Like, I'm going to kick you out. And so I kind of inherited his tenant. So then there were three of us living in the home. Uh, and actually, that was a lot of fun. You know, it's like three guys in their mid-20s, yeah. all single or whatever at the time. And yeah, we definitely had a good time. And did he get the $600 a month as well? Yeah, yeah. So he was actually part of my fraternity. So again, give him the same discount. So you're bringing in, you know, 1200 bucks a month in rent. You know, you're $1,600 total, you know, throwing the flood insurance. So, you know, you're living in, you know, Northern California for $800 a month. It's not this like grand slam, I'm living for free and making money. But I mean, that's pretty reasonable because you're getting appreciation, you're getting equity pay down, you're getting the tax write-offs. I mean, to me, 800 bucks a month to own my own place in Northern California is a pretty awesome deal. Yeah. And I think that's what people need to think about a lot because I think people go into house hacking, imagining that the tenants are going to pay for everything. And like, if it doesn't fit that criteria and give them like a 5% cash on cash return, then it's not a good deal. But I'm like, you know what? You're in the Bay area you would have to pay like $1,500 a month if you were to buy or rent your own place. So here you're getting your own property where you're getting like uh, equity pay down, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, sorry, principal pay down and you're building equity as the property appreciates and you get rent. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, but the thing is, that was only for two roommates. So about four months later, I had another friend who wanted to move in with us. And at the time, uh, again, we weren't renting out this bottom garage area. And I figured, you know what? We have an extra space. He's, again, my really close friend from college. Let me just rent out this place to him. Um, so then I had a fourth guy living in my garage where we all do our laundry. So he was gracious enough to let us walk into his room every day or whatever to use these common facilities. But again, charge him 600 bucks a month at first. And I felt kind of bad too because, like I mentioned, there's only one common bathroom. So we had three guys who all used one bathroom. So you had the master and had, had, had the, the bathroom to your own and you made the three buddies uh, share a place. Pretty much, yep. Awesome. But so now at this point, you know, you're 1800 bucks a month and you're getting everything covered. Yep. I mean, minus the like taxes and insurance. Insurance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, but that's a pretty awesome. So yeah, first you went from, you know, on your own, then getting a buddy, then the second one, and now the third one, and your essentially housing costs are about n neutral on a place in Northern California that you got a really good deal on th thanks to mom. I mean, that's a pretty smart place to be in when you're, you're in your mid-20s. So, I mean, from when you bought the house to when you got that third, you know, um, person move in with you, you know, how long of a period did that happen over? Was this over a, a full year or did it take two years to get up to having, you know, three, three tenants under the roof? Yeah. So, you know, even though I bought this property in August, I didn't actually move in until January. And then I uh, got the first tenant in March second tenant sometime in like July. And then the third tenant just happened to have a job up in Northern California. And he started in February of 2017. So almost a full year since that first tenant to that third tenant. Yeah. Awesome. And now, I mean, how was your, had you done any real estate investing during this sort of about a year when you were bought the property, fixing it up and going through roommates or was this sort of taking up everything you had, like mental capacity of like, great, I'm improving my financial situation, like I'm active in this real estate deal, or I mean, what else were you starting to build or think about during this time period? Yeah, so from buying the property till March, you know, I was getting everything ready and I got my first tenant inside. But then once I got that first tenant, um, he and I started talking about different business ideas and we actually started going to different real estate meetup groups together. So that was super exciting because I had a buddy to go to these events too, and we learned more about real estate investing. But you know, it's one of those things where like you can go to events, you can talk to all the people you want, but it still takes some time to actually do your first deal. So I didn't do my first actual real estate deal until the end of 2016. So it took me about a full year of actually, you know, going to these events till actually doing a real deal. And did you do that deal there in California? No, this first one was in Jacksonville, Florida. So I bought my first rental property there. Okay. So what, what made you then 
actually decide to do out of state investing? I mean, did you like you felt good with your job? I mean, were you still at North, Northrop Grumman at this time and like, yes. you know, decent salary? You, you know, you have essentially zero housing costs. What what made you say Let, let's look out of state? Yeah, I mean, basically what you said. Um, I got super interested in real estate investing. I want to do more of this, but realistically speaking. I don't think I could have afforded another property like this. Um, I'm sure your listeners know, but banks will limit how much they can lend to you based on your debt to income ratio. So if I already have a large amount of debt on this one single family property, it's going to be very hard to then buy another rental property in this area. And again, like I mentioned, when I bought this property, it was ready at a discount because I bought it from my mom. If I were to buy it on market, it probably would be for like $750,000. And again, like you mentioned, the whole 1% rule definitely does not make sense because there's no way you're going to rent a home here in the Bay Area for like $7,500 if you bought it for $750,000. Yeah. They probably rent yeah. for about $3,000. So yeah. the numbers don't work as well. And that's why I went out of state because the properties are more affordable and they can't hit those uh, general rules of thumb. So do you think you would have felt comfortable investing out of state if you hadn't done this like house hack and had some experience of renovating a place with in, with your dad's help and managing tenants, even though there were friends? Yeah, I think they were kind of separate skills, to be honest, because when you're investing out of state, it's more so building like a boots on the ground team that you can trust kind of without meeting them. Whereas the whole like house hacking and all that stuff is different because it's not just a rental play, right? You also want to buy a place where you're comfortable living in. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what do you think you've learned from doing the out of state investing that if you had to start all over again as a house hacker, you know, you, you could apply. So, you know, say you, you and Sharon decided to go live in, you know, San Antonio, Texas. What, what, how would you start over? Uh, that's an interesting question because I feel like house hacking is very much for, uh, I guess house hacking works really well depending on like your phase of life and what you want to do and where you are financially. Like right now, we no longer house hack. It's just Sharon and myself living in this house. I think we get to a certain point where you have enough finances that you don't need roommates or maybe you don't want roommates. But definitely when you are first starting out, it's amazing because you can live in a place like the Bay Area with almost zero cost. Um, I think one big lesson that I learned is to automate your um, rent collection. So I was telling my friends, oh, you can send me a check. You can give me cash or you can give me Venmo. I mean, that works. They're my friends. I see them every day. If they miss the rent, I just knock on the door and be like, yo, send me the Venmo. But it gets annoying, right? I don't want to be that nagging person. So it'd be great to just set them up with something like Cozy where they can just pay it automatically through their card or whatever or automatically send it from their debit account. Also, I would implement automatic rent increases. See, because they're my friends, the conversation to then increase their rent every single year on the dot is an awkward conversation. and I was also scared that I would lose them as a tenant, right? I, I like them. They're my friends. I don't want them to move out. Um, but of course, everyone does eventually. Yeah. But anyways, if it was automated, then I wouldn't have to have the awkward conversation and then I could just get more rent. Yeah, you have it. Have the conversation once up front and be like, hey, it's going to increase this percentage every year. And then it automatically happens via a uh, property management tool. Yeah. So, I mean, it, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is just from some of the out-of-state investing. I mean, you used house hacking, you know, you accidentally fell into it, but it really helps set you up financially to get to a different place in life. And what, what caused you to, you know, leave your job? I mean, I, I know you left Northrop Grumman and I know what you're doing now. So why don't you share with what you're doing now for the people that are listening? And let's just talk a little bit about that transition of like how house hacking helped you move on to, to this next phase of life. Yeah, so I think one of the coolest parts about house hacking and having basically zero cost of living expenses is that you are free to then do whatever you want. Um, I think a lot of people believe that when you house hack and you achieve financial freedom, it means that you're going to quit, retire, and then never work on anything ever again. And I don't think that's true. Like in reality, you're going to be super bored, right? But what it allows you to do is you can then leave the job that you don't like doing to pursue something that you're super passionate in. And it turns out that when you work in something that you actually care about, then you tend to work harder at it and you actually get better results from it and become wealthier overall. Um, as an engineer, it was really cool to work on these billion dollar projects, but I didn't feel like the skills I was learning at that job would translate to anything in my business. You know, like I'm really good at analyzing data from satellites, 
how is that going to help me, you know, financially? Or you're not going to open up a, a electrical panel out back and d- yeah. diagnose it. I'm never going to be able to create my own satellites. There's no way, right? I don't have a billion dollars to make my own satellite company. And I'm not thinking like Elon Musk to create like, you know, (laughs) like SpaceX or anything like that. So I figured, you know what? It's not really for me. I'm learning these skills. I had automated my job a long time ago. So, you know, I had a lot of free time at work to just read more books and understand more things. Um, I actually found a lot more value from like going to meetups, talking to people, learning negotiating skills, trying different things and like talking to brokers and whatnot. And so eventually, um, it just happened that this program that I was working on finished in 2019. And so they're saying, hey, Sean, um, great job. You know, you completed this program. We sent these satellites up into space. Now we want you to come back to Southern California to work on these other programs that are even cooler. And at that point in life, I said, you know what? It's a good time to break. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm going to venture off on my own. At the time, I had already flipped houses. I have owned some rental properties. And I was bringing in enough cash flow that I could survive. Like if I just didn't work anymore, I could break even every single month. So I was comfortable leaving my full-time job. And, and at, at that point in 2019, had you already kicked out all the roommates and you and Sharon are living together or did you still have some of the roommates in there? In 2019, I saw all the roommates in there. Okay. Yeah. And at that time, of course, like my friends had moved out. I brought in some new people. So there was a bit of a change in the tenant base at that time, but it was yeah. still fully occupied and I had, again, no cost of living expenses and I was still generating some positive income from the rents. So I felt very comfortable leaving my full-time job. Um, during that time, I actually started my own podcast. I created my YouTube channel and my meetup group. So I was gaining some traction in the real estate space. It was funny because I had that audience. One of my friends who was actually my lender for my flip project said, hey, Sean, why don't you work with us to provide some value to your like, audience base and help them give loans for their flip, uh, fixed flip projects? And so that's why now I work as a hard money lender. And it's really cool because all day long, I get to just talk on the phone with my friends and give them money. You know, I yeah. feel like Santa Claus just, hey, how, how's everything going? Do you need some funds for your project? And Yeah, that's pretty awesome where like, you know, you, you started doing your own show, you started the YouTube channel, and we'll put the links in the show notes for folks so that they can check out your show and your, your YouTube channel. And then all of a sudden, it, now you're like, okay, great. You know, the guy that I was uh, borrowing money from to do my projects is now offering me a job to work with him. And like, it just turned into something really cool where you're talking real estate all, all the time now. Exactly. So then now how, how are you spending your time, you know, over the past year, do you still like to do any fix and flips or is it all out of state investing? I mean, you know, one of the things you had touched on was the sort of phases of life, you know, I'm a big believer that you can house hack at any point in life. It just depends on the style of house hacking, but even our investing changes, like my early buy and hold investing was college housing, affordable housing, and now it's more a bit of higher end stuff. And I don't like to manage any properties anymore. I I'd sold off a lot of my stuff and invested into la- larger syndications. I mean, how has your investing changed over the past sort of year and a half, two years since you you left the full time job and now work as a hard money lender? Yeah. So you know, I was buying rental properties, but then at a certain point, you run out of capital to then buy more rental properties. So I thought, okay, how am I going to make more money? So that's when I got into flipping houses. I flipped houses. I did really great on some projects. I did really poorly on some projects. So right there, I'm kind of hit or miss, and I want to build up my capital stack even more before I jump back into flipping houses. So that might happen in the next few years. Uh, Sharon and I have started buying more rental properties out of state, and that has been going really well. We might even go into like larger multifamily in the near future. So instead of buying like duplexes and fourplexes, we might go into a 10 or 20 unit complex in the next year. Awesome. I mean, so if you're sort of looking back over your, your real estate investing career here and, you know, from leaving school, I mean, what's something you think you did really right? I would say what I did right was I got started relatively early. You know, luckily enough, I got exposed to my coworkers not enjoying their jobs. That kind of drove me to, you know, finding out these different paths. Whereas if I got a job at, say, SpaceX, where everyone's super passionate about their projects, then maybe I would continue working there, but I heard their salary doesn't pay that well. So, you know what I mean? Like, like some people really love their jobs, but it doesn't pay very well. Whereas other people get into a role where they know they don't like it. So they are forced to pivot and do something different. Yeah. And then, you, you know, you, you might have alluded to this a bit already with, you know, the, the flips, the ones that went well and didn't go well. I mean, what, what's the one big thing you do differently with the way your real estate investing career has, has gone? Yeah. Uh, one big mistake that I made was I got overzealous. And then I over leveraged. So, you know, yeah. over leveraging on one property 
it whatever like most people can recover from one property but i had done so well on my very first deal that i got into contract for four different projects at the same time so on a when the market's going really well that's amazing because you have four great deals and you can make like 100 grand for each property that you flip but if the market turns then boom now you just lost 100 grand on each property that you that you flipped right um so you know going forward i'd probably take it slower you know, maybe put more money down instead of just trying to over leverage and get the max that you can get. Um, yeah, I think those are the biggest lessons I learned from that. You know, and I also think some of that, it's a great lesson learned, but that changes to where you're at in a phase of life. Like when you're young and you're in your 20s and it's just you, you know, you can be a little more risky versus once you start get a little older, a little more settled, your your pot of money starts to grow. You're, you start to realize like, hey, I've got more to risk and the, the way we like to invest uh, starts to change too with, with the phase of life. And to me, that's all, all okay. You know, life changes and how we invest in real estate changes as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate that I have no dependents and I'm also fortunate that, you know, I, I've heard stories, right? I've had a podcast where I've had several guests on and several of them have gone completely bankrupt uh, during the last crash. Of course, they've recovered now, but to go through that entire experience, like that must've been extremely challenging. So again, during my like quote unquote downfall, Nothing really changed for me. I still ate the same food, lived in the same house, drove the same car. Uh, it's just that my bank account was smaller. That's it. I mean, it's a good way to learn the lesson, right? When, you know, not, not much changes, but you still get the, the, the lesson learned versus yeah. like, you know, a lot of folks completely lost everything and had to go bankrupt in 07 and 08. Awesome, man. It's been so cool having you on the show and I appreciate you sharing your story. But before we let you go, we like to ask all of our guests a set of final six questions. You ready for them? All right, let's do it. Awesome. All right, so question number one, what is your favorite personal finance resource? So blog, book, podcast, whatever it may be, personal finance related. Yeah, so right now I'm super interested in a podcast called My First Million. And uh, it basically talks about these different hustles that people do to start their first business. And uh, I got introduced to it because I'm subscribed to something called The Hustle, which is a morning kind of newsletter that talks about different uh, things in the business world. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I, I know the hustle, the morning newsletter. I'm going to put the first, uh, my first million as well in the show notes for folks. If you want to go check that out, I'm going to have to start listening to uh, that, that one as well. All right. So question number two, what is your favorite real estate related resource? So blog book, podcast in the real estate investing world. Yeah, of course. So obviously everyone's heard of bigger pockets before, but I think that if anyone really wants to get into real estate investing seriously, I think they really need to start joining different meetup groups. So I'm a host of a meetup group. I know there are tons of events. And if you want to kind of uh, meet up with your local chapters, just go to meetup.com and then search real estate near where you are. And you can just meet some great people. I, I found that the real estate community is super friendly and they're very generous uh, with their information. So yeah, just go there, talk to them, find someone who is doing what you want to do, and then just try to add value to them. Awesome, man. I, I love that. Uh, t not, not something online. Go, go do it in person. All right. So question number three, what has been your favorite travel destination so far? You know, I really enjoyed Japan. I had a really good time when I was there a couple of years ago and definitely look forward to going back there. Awesome. All right. So number four, what is next on your travel vacation list? And I'll, I'll let you sort of give us two answers. Like right now with COVID happening, you know, what, what's on the radar and then Hey, when the world's more normal, what, what's the next big trip you, you want to go do? Yeah. So my girlfriend, Sharon, is actually pretty famous for being a digital nomad. She spent two years kind of traveling around the world um, a few years ago, and she's getting that urge again, right? We've been cooped up in this house, even though it's just us two, but it's still just stuck in one place for the past year. So once we get our vaccines, we're going to go and probably travel to East Europe and maybe live there for three years while we work remotely, because luckily, you know, she can work remotely. And for me, I just need to make my phone calls. So. Should be good to go. Awesome. So what were you thinking in Eastern Europe? To be honest, I'm not the planning person. I kind of just go along. She's the one yeah. that's going to plan the trip. And then I'll be like, yeah, let's go. So I haven't been, but you really need to look at Lithuania. Like I first started hearing about it and I was like, I have no desire to ever like go about Lithuania, but they're becoming this like cool little tech hub, you know, like Uber has call centers there. It's a really cool little high tech country. So it's, it's on my list to travel to, uh, ne next time we start going. And then awesome. for folks that haven't heard of Sharon, I'm going to put her, her stuff in the show notes as well. You definitely have to go, go check her out as well. 
All right. So question number five, what is your biggest bucket list item that you have not accomplished yet? It's hard to say because I feel like I did a lot of things already. Like I jumped off an airplane. I've done budget jumping. I've done cliff diving. What are some of the common things that people say that they haven't done yet? It's usually those, like it's a travel or early retirement or some, some adrenaline type junkie thing. Yeah. Because like, I haven't really had that feeling of like, oh, I really want to do something and then not done it. Like if I really want to do something, I usually just do it. So it's really hard to answer that one. Awesome. Well, good. That's a good, good, good enough answer and good place to be in life. All right. So the sixth and final question, what is your favorite life hack? Um, my favorite life hack is a to-do list. It's very simple, but I know when I don't do my to-do list and I wake up in the morning and there's nothing there, then I usually waste my day. But if I already have everything planned out the night before with like, all right, this time, this time, I have this task, this time, this time, I have this task. Then as long as I complete my checklist, um, over the long run, I find that I become super, super, um, what's the word? Like I become super complicated or accomplished. I feel very yeah. accomplished, right? By doing all these tasks on the to-do list and I just feel better for it. So with your to-do list, do you do like a top three or a top five, or it's just high priority stuff that has to get done for the day? Yeah, it's probably high priority stuff that has to be done for the day. And it just keeps me on track, right? Instead yeah. of procrastinating and saying, okay, I'll do this later. No, I wrote this down for this time. I'm going to do it. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it's, it's taken this approach of instead of just being reactive to my day and getting a phone call or emails that come in and or going down the rabbit hole of social media, it's like, let me just plan a little bit the night before so I can be proactive with my day. Yeah, I mean, I even block out sometimes during my day so I don't take calls, I don't look at emails during that time so I can focus on the things that work out long term. Awesome. Sean, it's been so awesome uh, having you on the show. If folks want to learn more about you, where's the best place for them to uh, find you? Yeah. If you guys want to reach out to me, you can reach out to me at my email, Sean, S-E-A-N, at everythingrei.com. You can also check out my website where I have my podcast and YouTube uh, content on there as well. And that's everythingrei.com. And if you don't remember, if you're driving in the car or something, we'll put it in the show notes uh, for his, his email address, what he just shared with everyone, his website and his podcast. Uh, and in his YouTube channel as well. Awesome. Sean, thank you again for being on. Um, I'm going to keep following you, you and Sharon on um, social media. I love the stuff y'all, y'all do as a couple too. That's pretty fun. Thanks so much, Andrew. Appreciate it. Awesome. Awesome.